It's Wrestling Observer Radio. Garrett and Dave here on a Friday, and Espresso too. He snuck in there. Yeah, he just jumped uh, in as soon as he saw the the thing starting. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're going to talk about all the news in the Observer and some of the news that's been out there today. Uh, let I don't know how much left that we need to discuss this, but you did have a, a long story on the latest in the Janelle Grant uh, lawsuit and the. The non-anonymous officers now that came out, thanks to Marchman and uh, John Pollock and Brandon Thurston, and I was, you know, I was happy that we saw another posting uh, by by Tim Marchman because obviously with with uh, his Vice News uh, not being around anymore, Vice went down and Deadspin went down too, right? Yeah, Deadspin went down too. Man, this journalism thing is not doing well at all. Yeah, so. Is there anything that you and Brian didn't really talk about that we need to discuss? To me, it just it, it it verifies information that you know maybe we had sort of thought about, but I, but it's still I think the question out there is what did folks know? And uh, you know now that we have the names, I still don't it's I still can't tell or I'm not sure that they knew. The, the the uh insanity that was happening the, the, the i don't know that anyone that was happening i don't know that anyone knew the you know the the depraved aspect of it i think that they may have known um well i mean i i, I mean i think brad blum clearly knew that there was something going on and and probably nikon if if we're to believe the suit if only because vince you know in the lawsuit it was basically that that they talked to vince about it and they kind of said stuff and they went to Vince and said, is she trustworthy? So it's like, is she, tr- if, 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 if there's that, then they at least know that something's happening and, and, or the risk of something to happen. If you know a little bit about Vince's history, right, right, right. And, and the NDAs, I mean, but then again, I don't know that they knew about the NDAs um, because that was all Jerry McDivitt. And if you remember when that first came out in 2022, and this is, after she's gone, you know, I mean, that was new to everybody on the board. So, um, you know, I don't, and again, I don't know what Stephanie knew, but, um, you know, the, um, so, so I don't know that they even knew about the NDAs until, you know, whenever it was when they were first contacted, um, you know, and, and Nick being on the board when the board started investigating that. But as far as knowing about um, them having an affair, and you know, I mean, I, I would, I would suspect strongly i would have suspected strongly that everyone knew because it's one of those things that people you know it was something that people talked about in the office like i said when um when the story first broke in the wall street journal i mean the name janelle grant you know it was was not a secret i mean nobody reported it i don't think i I think actually one person reported but nobody followed up on it because you know you just don't report names in situations like that but the name was known and it was known by the people in the company. So, and, and if like rank and file people know, I, I, you know, you know about Nick Khan, right? Nick Khan knows a lot. That's all I'll say. I mean, there have been multiple times, not just one, multiple times where Nick Khan has known about non uh, wrestling observer gigs that I was going to do before <laughs> I was ever asked about them. <laughs> it's, that's how much he knows. I mean, Nick Khan, uh, Nick Khan knows a lot. So I'll just say that, like, I believe that he knew, you know, that aspect. And, and the lawsuit pretty much says that. Um, I mean, as far as who's, you know, I mean, like, you can go in there and go, hey, he's the company president. He could have done something. But look, the whole board of directors, when they did know, 100% know um, about the NDAs and everything like that and didn't want him back, the fact is they couldn't keep him out. And yeah. they voted unanimously, and they still couldn't keep him out. So, no, Nick Khan could not have, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, his choice was get fired. That's it, right? You know, I mean, and and uh, you know, I mean, as far as that goes, and and Brad Blum the same way. And you know, who knew? Like again, we don't even know why. Um, you know, what happened to to Brian Nurse? I mean, if this had something to do with it or not, we don't even know. So, it's it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing thing, and. Uh, well, that's pretty much all. I mean, I don't, I don't expect any more. I know people are looking for heads to roll, and I don't expect anything at all in that direction to happen right now. Um, but 
you know, and I, I expect them to also to, um, um, I would say, I, 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 um, I expect if nothing else, you know, some changes to be made there, but I don't, I don't expect heads to roll, but maybe, the, maybe the, go ahead. The line about Nick Khan and the culture changing, that is, that is their line to, to the press about we're working on the culture yeah. and, and, and changing the culture. I mean, <laughs> I would, you know, I would hope so. Like, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know. you have to, to to do that. Well, you don't sure. want you. You certainly don't want anything at this level happening again. Um, you know, but again, I and again, this is certainly not defense of anyone or anything. Um, but you know, if you look at like this, this was you got to remember what this business came from, and that's not defending anything now. The fact that it's better doesn't change anything that it's still not, you know, that, that things weren't good. But I mean, if, if you know where this business came from, this is, this is not, um, I don't want to say it's not shocking because the, the, the depravity of it was further than I expected. I'll say that, but, but, you know, it's still been a business. It's been a male dominated business for so long. And it's only in the last couple of years where women have had anything and it's just because they did get over. And now as Lance storm said, it's like there's enough of them and they're big enough stars to where they are treated better because they have to be, you know, I mean, because they're they're It's, it's not a male business anymore. Um, you know, women used to just be like these attractions. I mean, you know, interchangeable, Oh, the women are coming to town and it doesn't matter who and anything like that. So they had no power. And now, I mean, there's power and, and, you know, I mean, the Mercedes thing, I can tell you that, you know, cause I've heard from people there, um, the women there are very, very happy about this Mercedes deal because of how much money she's making, which is nowhere n- near what they're saying, yeah. but it's still a very substantial amount of money. And, um, you know, just the idea that a woman is paid along the lines of, uh, you know, of, of, of you know, a top male star, which has never been the case before. And I think that it's kind of like, they feel that, that her deal is, you know, a breakthrough. Well, Rhonda, Rhonda was the first, right? When, Rhonda when was the first, but, but Rhonda never counted because the whole thing was, is that she was like that outside celebrity, like Logan Paul, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, or, or Brock Lesnar. Yeah. Rhonda, Rhonda actually, I think that there was a point where, um, Rhonda was the second highest paid in the company behind Brock Lesnar at one point. You know, I'm sure Roman Reigns, you know, greatly surpassed her later. But because um, I know one of the one of the people who um, was discussing contract offers to me when a deal came and basically said, yeah, I'm I'm number three, um, you know, behind Brock and Rhonda. So this is many years ago. So but that didn't count. Uh, Becky Lynch did count, you know, because she's from, you know, the wrestling thing and Becky Lynch and Charlotte Flair both have have excellent contracts i mean that's the kind of that's what the the deal basically that mercedes was looking for in wwe was something along the lines of them and 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 didn't get it so she went somewhere else and and got it i guess or got got whatever it was that she was looking for i mean she got a number that she was happy with and signed i just remember when i was a kid and i first started watching wwf and wendy richter and cindy lopper are on the television and promoted as a big deal. Obviously, if you're with Cindy Lauper, Cindy Lauper was a giant star back in, right, in the right. mid 80s. And then I just remember Wendy Richter being gone. Yep. And in in that time, it was just she was like, you know, I think what what Vince just gave her a contract and said, here, sign this. And she said, wait, you know, I want to let have- me let me look at my lawyer. And then they just took the title from her. They were ready to fire her anyway, though. I mean, because um um, her and Mula had a falling out, and and Mula still had the power to uh, to get things done. Not as much power as she had before, but you know enough power, obviously, to that they you know made sure to get the belt off of her. Like you know, like back then, that was so important. We got to get the belt off her first, then we fire her. Yeah, and she didn't she didn't sniff out the part of that there was a ruse going on. Like that's the that's the thing that's hard for me to understand because she knew who she was supposed to wrestle. And then there's this other person in the ring with like a mask on, like yeah. that would kind of freak yeah, me out. Go, okay. What's going early. on? She may have been naive too, though. You know, she wasn't, um, 
you know, she'd been in business for a couple of years, but I mean, at that point, wasn't she, um, God, like 20, 25, 26, 26 years old, maybe. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and, and I don't think there's any history of double crosses that she would have known of, you know? Right, um, right. I mean, if it, it's very clear, if you watch that match, as soon as it was over, she knew that she'd been double crossed. Right. I mean, immediately, but when it was going on, you know, I mean, I don't think that she, um, I don't think she had any clue. No. I mean, you could tell just by, she was just trying to work her match. So let's talk about the uh, big business show, the rating that came out, which uh, I think was a bit of a disappointment overall. I, if you just look at the number for the sake of the I, number, I, 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 th- I thought I thought it was a very disappointing number. I mean, they've been building the mat, the, the show up. Um, I mean, we can certainly look in hindsight. You know, mm-hmm. number one, um, you know, there's there's a couple of lessons to be learned, and obvious the obvious ones that people already know. And one is is that you got something like this, you freaking promote it. That's what promoting is, is all about. I mean, I think with the benefit of hindsight that that the success of Punk doing it that way was a really big mistake. You know, I mean, it was it was it, it was so. I mean, I'm just saying it was so successful that it taught them something that became a really big mistake. So they did it again. Um, it, it's it is interesting because they did draw very well in the building. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, um, they had their biggest um, their biggest um, TV crowd in. Uh, geez, it's a long time since they had a TV crowd that big. I think um, maybe um, the last show in September in Arthur Ashe Stadium may have been the biggest TV crowd that I can recall. That was you know like because they had like they had ninety five hundred paid you know and and over probably probably ten thousand in the building. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that was, that was very successful, but the TV ratings, I mean, there was, it was the same, it's basically the same number that they got the week before and that they've been getting, um, you know, 0.27. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's tough competition. You had, you had some, um, get some big college basketball tournament games, but they did not draw big numbers. They drew much less than AEW. You had two NBA games. Well, you know, one NBA game. ESPN had the doubleheader, but the one NBA game head to head, which was a which did a, which did fine. And then and Survivor did great. Survivor you know. was a giant. What happened there? Yeah, yeah. Survivor. I don't know, but Survivor, yeah, the Survivor number was giant. Yeah, I don't think SmackDown's gonna be able to beat Survivor this week. I thought that SmackDown would be number one this week. And um, I mean, it is, you know, Rock is on the show again, so you know it'll do well, but I don't think it's beaten that number. Um so, um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, Survivor was, was the big number one show probably of the week. And it went, you know, I mean, of, of the, it will be this week because, you know, the Oscars obviously were the biggest, but that was last Sunday. But um, so they went ahead to that. That probably hurt a little bit, too. But, you know, even even saying all that, it should have been bigger. You know, it was um, they had a world title. They had Okada. They had Will Ospreay. Although, you know, Okada and Will Ospreay are not going to draw big numbers on, on you know, the idea with them is, is that to me is like you, you, you have to build them. Um, and, um, you know, and, and it's not even build them. It's build the whole team and the whole perception and everything like that. Slow process. Um, it's not going to be easy. And it's not going to be easy at all right now because uh, WWE is WrestleMania season and um, people only have so many hours a week to watch wrestling. I mean, this is about, you know, I mean, this number is about where there are and it's not a bad number. I mean, I thought it was a bad number for this specific show. Yeah. But if it was just a normal Wednesday um, and you saw this number, it'd be like, yeah, it's a normal number. But but yeah, she did not draw extra. And the other one, too, is, is you know, Willow and uh, Riho main event. You know, it, it, this is the big thing. And and it goes the same for, um, for Raw as well. I mean, it's like if Raw has the wrong people in the main event, um, it will tumble badly and they've learned that so they don't put the wrong people in the main event um i mean they did put Sami Zayn and, and and chad gable in this week but it was also part of this gauntlet for a, a wrestlemania match and right now the idea of a wrestle the stakes of being a wrestlemania match are big enough that 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 you know that 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 worked um but you know willow and rio was not it you know and they've that's that's happened before it's like if you don't have a strong enough main event you are going to drop at the end and this was not a strong main event and um some people were like oh everyone knew mercedes was going to come out i don't i don't think they did you know i mean but 
whatever, you know, it, it's, you know, they, especially on Wednesday, they have to have a main event that's a main event rather than put Samoa Joe and uh, Wardlow on first. You know, maybe that should have been on last. That being said, it only made a slight bit of difference. It's mm-hmm. not like the reality is, is when the show started, they were at the same level that they usually are. So they were going to be at the same level. They did not have extra people tune in because Mercedes was on the show. So that is, you know, so it was it was going to do a normal number. You know, like if they had put, you know, like not put put Willow and Riho on, you know, early and something else late at the end, would it have done better? Yes, but it's still, maybe it could have done an 0.28. It's not like it's going to, there was a difference between that and doing an 0.30 because it's not. I have a question about that Mercedes segment. I thought the presentation was awesome. She looked like a giant star. All of that. She but came. On- she came. She came off well, and they that uh, the the entrance music's gonna get people to chant CEO at her as a personality. I think she came off really strong. Um, but the jury's out. I mean, the thing with her is is like, you know, um, I mean, I I was I was happy to see the way she moved. She seemed like she was healed because that's. She had a very bad injury, and and sometimes so much so that she said she the doctor was saying something about her career. Possibly yeah, yeah, yeah. Her career was in jeopardy. I guess, I guess it was a very serious injury, and so and but we still don't know what she's got physically because she hasn't wrestled yet. So and and the thing is, is that she her standard. It's not like it's someone who's like a great personality. Not that not a personality is bad, but the but some people get over based on personality, and then an injury like that that makes them tone down their style doesn't really hurt them that much. But I think that she, because she made her bones on being a great wrestler, um, you know, if she can still be a great wrestler, then, then that's fine. But if, if there's a difference, it could hurt her. Yeah. I guess my question is we knew that the opening segment was going to be the biggest number uh, uh, of the show. And so mm-hmm. she comes out, I was waiting for her to actually promote something and so she was I. didn't. So was I. And it's so. like you have, you know, you cannot have her debut again. Like this is the first time she's going to debut. And the only time I, I would have set something up where her first program is going so that, well, you know, have, and, or her somebody, first have, match. Have, have somebody have somebody come. Even if they didn't come out in that promo, you know, come out very soon afterwards. But yeah, I mean, and, and you know what? Like, what is her big promo? Was it Julia Hart? Is it is it Tony Storm? Is it um, Britt Baker? You know, who's not even on TV yet? Um, is it Serena Deeb? You know, who was seemed to do a promo in that direction, and then we haven't seen her. There was uh, a tease of Willow, and then at the end of the show, they raise each other's well, hands. Well, Willow Willow is a natural match. That's probably the match to do on the first pay per view, I think. But that's a weird one too because Will is very popular. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's probably it's it, it's probably the best first match to do storyline wise. Not that a lot of people know the story, but it's still more people know that story than any other story. Yeah, I just thought if we learned anything from last week, which is you know you have these moments where you know that the audience is going to be there, and you can use those moments to set things up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just thought that that was a little bit of a missed opportunity there for them in the in the beginning of that show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was. Uh, um, but the, I mean, you know, the there, there's 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 a lot going. I mean, it's 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 it, you know, it was a disappointing number though. Um, and um, you know, it's not the the year to have disappointing numbers, but it's still, it was still third place. They still beat they still beat networks. You know, they beat. Uh, abc in in for an hour of the two and they beat uh nbc the whole night and they beat fox in the second hour obviously got killed by cbs but everyone did um and lost to espn and i think telemundo as well but it's still you know it's still among the 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 strongest of all the stations um for the night and when you know so so it's it was was, the, the number is a big success but you know you know, I yeah, I expected a higher number. So in that sense, you know, you look at it and go like, yeah, it's disappointing. Will Osprey was on the Chris Jericho podcast, I believe. Uh, I read the excerpts yes. in the Observer, and he mentioned just the difference in the offers 
Uh, and it sounded, I mean, he didn't give any terms, but it sounded like the WWE offer was lower money wise. And also it, it, it was, it was significantly lower. Yeah. And also just the lack of flexibility. Uh, it seemed he doesn't, he does not want to leave the UK because yeah, of his that, familial that was, situation. Yeah. I mean, he had said he was up, he was, he would have done it if he needed to, but yeah, I thought not... that was maybe negotiation. <laughs> like, like, no, it, was, it was part of, it was part it was part of it but um it, you know he didn't want to leave i mean i think that's been clear all along but the fact that you know he you know if, if wwe had made the right offer and said you have to move here he, he he would have done it but not having to move and to commute this way was a plus for aw if the money was close and as it turned out with aw offering more money as well it was a moot point you know what i mean it's like he got he got what he got. And, um, well, I mean, um, you know, that's whatever. I mean, WWE doesn't need him. They don't need anyone. But, you know, he is the most talented wrestler in the world. And and you would, you know, it was a, it was a miss by WWE not getting him. Um, you know, you could always use, I mean, the guy's got, you know, I mean, he's got more charisma than Cody Rhodes. And look at Cody Rhodes there, you know. I he mean, may not be able to act like Cody though. Cody hits that Cody, 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 Cody Cody's he can't, but he can't. I mean, I've seen him in, in programs. I saw him with the, the 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 Kenny Omega promo. I saw him with Michael Oku. He can do that stuff. He's he's you know, it's like there was the question. Um, but you know, even the promo on Wednesday, it's like he can be that guy. I mean, certainly it would take him a little while to get to the Seth Rollins level, but once he got there, he would surpass him. Mm -hmm. And with Cody, um, you know, I mean, Cody has so much goodwill. I'm not saying he could, it would surpass Cody, but he'd be um, in time. In time, he probably would just because he's 30 and Cody's 38. And, um, you know, he's on the way up and Cody's there. And, 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 you know, in the ring, he's much better than Cody. Um, you know, and I mean, Cody's fantastic as a as, as character and his, his story, you know, he really made the story work. Um, the funny part is, is essentially, you know, Will can do the same story in AEW. It won't be as big because number one, they don't have a Roman Reigns opponent. And, you know, again, the AEW title historically doesn't mean as much as the WWE title to, to as many people, but they can still do that story. Yeah, they, they have the location of their biggest pay-per-view yeah. that. They're going to they do, sure do. They as, sure do. They as, sure do. His home base. Yeah. It seems like, and, you know, I think we can probably use how TKO has run the UFC as an example, but Osprey, Mercedes, Okada, those are like three giant free agents. And it seemed like to WWE, the. I don't even know if it's a risk because they have so much money, but there's something that tells them like, you know, we're only going to get them for it's like money ball, but in wrestling and mm, yes and no. I mean, like with Mercedes, it was like, I think that, I think that with Mercedes, there's probably the idea that, okay, if, if Becky Lynch gets this money, it's fine, but she's not at Becky Lynch's level. And look, we didn't have her for the last you know, year and a half or whatever it's been at least a year and a half. And, you know, that I don't think there was any, like there was never a great impetus to get her back because if there was, they'd have gotten her back. Well, how much of it was she left us and she didn't fail and come back begging in the old regime. With, I would with, think with, that, with, that was with, most of it with Vince, with Vince that, that actually usually would work because he wants you back um, with these, with this, crew i i mean i just think that that they have in her case she's already been slotted she's been there for years and uh, they don't want to change her slot you know i mean that's they don't want to slot her at the becky lynch level or the rhea ripley level um although i don't know what real ripley is getting right now but um you know but but as far as they already know the slot that she's in um as far as okada you know my gut on okada is i mean they wanted okada I mean, they they pushed Shins Shinsuke Nakamura. I mean, I heard, I heard, you know, about Okada. You know, we talked about Okada first. It was from the WWE side, like we're going to get Okada. We think, um, and they didn't. Um, but in the end, it was like their offer to Okada was, you can, you can be on WrestleMania, 
<laughs> and and they had people there who goes, you know, were basically like, look, Okada's got money already, and he just wants to, you know, be the star, um, and we can make him the star, and they can't, and they guessed wrong, you know. I mean, they, you know, it was it was just they didn't feel. And then by the time it got there, I mean, he'd already pretty much committed to, to yeah. AEW, and with Will. You know, with Will, it was just that that they saw him as, you know, may, maybe AJ Styles, maybe, you know, when AJ first came in, maybe not even at that level because AJ Styles had a little bit of a name in the United States from TNA, um, not realizing that, that, you know, again, he's at a, he's at a different level, but, you know, because. And he's you, so much younger than when AJ came to WWE. Mm, and, and so much better personality. But I mean, the whole thing, more so much more charisma. But the thing is, is that not that AJ doesn't have charisma or anything like that, and that AJ is not a great wrestler. AJ is, you know, obviously when he first came in there, and and still now he's a super talented guy. But the um, but the thing, you know, with with Ospreys, I I know people in that company who were very very high on him, and that were very upset. I don't say very upset, but upset sure, surely um, that they didn't get him because they knew he was this good. And they just thought that, like, he's a guy who can be, like, a real major player here. Um, you know, because with Okada, the reality is his interviews are so important there. And, you know, he's he doesn't speak English that well. He'd have to be protected. He'd need a manager. They're kind of shitty with managers anyway. I mean, Okada would do well, but whatever. But, I mean, with, with Will, it was at the end... Um, they didn't see him as big as Tony saw him. And I think the difference is, is that Tony knew him, you know, Tony, Tony was at your call. And I mean, even the deal was already made. Okay. But, here, here's my real question on that. Yeah. Because you and I had a conversation before AEW even began about Kenny Omega and WWE. Kenny Omega in WWE was an interesting idea. I think ultimately, Kenny Omega's fan base probably did want him in AEW, but there's a side of me that wondered like, oh, if they really believed in Kenny, what could they have done with Kenny? And we see with, with Cody what they can do for you if they really believe in you. But you, awesome. have, to be able, you have to be able to carry the ball too. Sure. But, 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 you know, I mean, if Kenny was in that position, Kenny, you know, Cody, Cody did a really good job in his promos. Um, and I mean, it's not like good, bad promo. It's just a good job with his promos and explaining things and endearing. You know, Cody Cody made a commitment to be the guy. You know, I mean, do the media. I mean, it's like, it's not just, I'm going to go in there and do my match. It's sign the autographs in front of everyone and making sure everyone knew. The lay and of the land. He understood the lay of the land. Cody Cody did a, well. a absolutely fantastic job of presenting himself as a star. Um, you know, I mean, not exploiting the dusty thing while at the same time it's there and and a giant part of his story, you know, and at a time when people are kind of like nostalgic, you know, for their childhood and stuff, and this is Dusty's son and everything. And also, you know, the other big thing of Cody that nobody can ever duplicate, and it was was a huge part of his success, was he was the first star to first, jump. And everybody, yep. every, everyone's jumping in one direction. And, you know, that fan base is, you know, kind of getting frustrated. You know, I mean, it's, this company is supposed to die. Everyone's telling us they're going to die. <laughs> and everyone's and people are going there yeah. and they're not dying. You know, it's like. You know, it's like it's like you know, uh, Mister what's Mister Wizard. They were supposed to be dead by now. You know, <laughs> I mean, Triple H was going to stomp them into the ground, and it didn't happen. Okay, so, so so here's but here's my point about Will. Yes. Triple H knew Kenny Omega. If you know Kenny Omega, you have to know Will Osprey, right? Like well, he, he, I mean, did he know how good he was as a wrestler? Probably seventy five percent. He's not sitting there watching tapes of these guys. It's like he's is he hearing, oh yeah, this guy Will Ospreay is one of the best guys. And it's kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they, you know, I mean, it's like it could be the ricochet thing, you know, not that you know, Ricochet ended up making it and everything, but you know, there's that that blowback. Everyone tells you somebody's great, and and if you've if you've never seen them or they're not in your system, and you hear it so much, 
you get to that that thing of like, well, if I don't know it, they're all exaggerating. I mean, I know that mentality. I've seen it with people. And, you know, you, you know, it's, it's, I mean, as far as like, as far as like, if he, he, I, I don't think that he fully understood. And I think Tony Khan totally fully understood because Tony Khan actually saw him, you know, all over, you know, I mean, he would, he would watch the new Japan stuff in the middle of the night. And he, again, watched stuff. He went to your call. He's seen the guy from, you know, again, probably when he was 22 years old to now and seen him change his style and see him grow and go from a, you know, I mean, I mean, Levesque might've still thought he's, you know, the guy that used to wrestle Ricochet. We got mm-hmm. Ricochet. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? It's like, it's good. He's great. Okay. That's great. We, we can always use another one. Can you imagine <laughs> Will Ospreay and Logan Paul? <laughs> I just thought of that right now because of the Ricochet thing. Um, yeah, they'd have an unbelievable match, you know, because of Logan Paul's natural ability. It'd actually be an incredible match. Yeah. But every, you know, everyone does. Yeah. You know, so no, and, and Will, Will's going to have insane matches in AEW for sure. Oh, we've already seen two of them. And there he's only done two. He's going to go through this year with, you know, again. And then the next one, you know, could be at worst as good as the Takeshi match, right? At worst, at best, could be, you know, another Omega Okada. So from Robbie, he's got a super chat question. He says, do you believe or do you think WWE missing out? is partly a result of putting too much faith in training college athletes from scratch. No, 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 no. That's those two different categories. Um, I think it was, um, you know, like there was a time where I think that they had the mentality, but they don't have that mentality now where, you know, you hear, and I mean, and again, I've, I've heard this even from people in their system, you know, as recently as a few weeks ago, that you know you would rather get a guy and take him from scratch than bring in somebody with a lot of experience that's good because now we have to teach them to break all their bad habits whereas if we if they start in our system they don't have any bad habits so that mentality does still exist but um you know if someone's you know it's like for a rank and file guy it's one thing but but when the guy again you know well there's the will osprey's the only one you know it's like it's it's, you know, he's a guy who, like Okada, you know, said whatever it was four or five years ago. Remember when we were down there? And um, I, I, we, I don't know. I'm not sure. Wait, you were not at that, sh- at that show, were you? The only time I was with you when we talked to Okada was at the studio. Um, and we interviewed him in the studio. And remember we showed him the picture that the Photoshop that someone made of you it, with, with the money flying in the air dressed yeah, as yeah. Okada? That was the only time that I that I've talked to him with you. I don't remember if he said that at that time though. Okay, well it wasn't to me anyway, it was to Mark Ramonde, but Okay. Um, but um but I was there. You know, it's like I I had just interviewed him and then Mark Ramonde interviewed him and then Mark comes out and goes, "Yeah, he said when Will Ospreay's 30, you know, cuz I think where, where how are the conversation went? You know, like, "Oh, you're the best in the world" or whatever, which, you know, I didn't say to him cuz I wouldn't, but my I don't know what Mark said to him. I shouldn't say it, say it like that, but but whatever, Mark Ramonde came up to me and just goes, you know, Okada said to me that that when Will Ospreay's 30, he's going to be better than all of us. And I, I remember that went in my head because at the time it was, you know, yeah, he's really, really good and 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 everything like that. But, you know, um, when he said that, it was kind of like, OK, and he knows better than anyone. Was that the same day that uh, Mark broke the Josh Barnett story while Josh Barnett was recording uh, yes. New Japan with Jim Ross. Okay. Then it is that same day that we were there. It, was, it absolutely was that same day. Yes. Yes. Um, so uh, Mark Coleman, uh, he is doing much better and he was Thank God. vocal and he woke up and was very happy. And it looks like you and John Pollock have already chosen him for the uh, Shaq Gaspard <laughs> award for next have, year. How can you, how do you not? Yeah, what a story. What a crazy story. And you know, I mean, you know, he had a heart attack not that many years ago and you know, hip replacement and you know, had alcohol issues that apparently he's licked, thank God. And um yeah, I mean, um yeah, what a what a what a story. I feel bad for him, you know, his 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 dog died. You know, his dog was like his his second, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like like always, always with him and all that, but um you know, he got his, you know, 
I mean, he woke up and it was like he was so happy that his parents were still alive and happy that he was alive, too. Because yeah. he, you know, I mean, it it was it was double touch and go for him in the sense of, yeah, he saved his parents. But, you know, I mean, he passed out in a fire with smoke inhalation and, you know, the they had to get him out of there. And that roof collapsed very shortly after. So I mean, if if the if the um, fire department wasn't there, and that was a major fire, you know, I mean, like you know, they, I don't know if you, will, it's in the Observer, but they, it wasn't just like a fire department. It was like, like what was it, six, seven, eight fire departments came to that house. It was a major fire, and um, you know, thank God they got there fast enough to get him airlifted to the hospital and saved his life because. I don't know that much more time that he, he would have made it. And if that roof collapsed, he wouldn't have for sure. What so, was the cause of the fire? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I haven't, I haven't heard a thing about it. It was, I mean, I just know that the whole family was asleep and it was 4 AM and the dog, you know, the dog saved all their lives, you know, by barking or saved event, you know, I mean, essentially saved all their lives because they would have all died in the fire mm-hmm. except the dog, the dog woke them up. And um, or woke Mark up, and Mark then, but the both parents would have died if it was not for for Mark. So, um, yeah, what a what a what a story. I mean, I um, um, yeah, yeah. They might have to uh, turn that one into a movie. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, Dwayne probably picked the wrong Mark to do. I was a, just about to say a, the the a, smashing a movie. machine. Yeah, yeah, he's starting. He's into the, the movie starting. On, I think May first, but in, in, you know, right after you know, a couple. It's like a month after Mania. In, in case he gets hurt, he's got that month leeway essentially. Um, and um, but yeah, he may pick the wrong mark as far as to doing a doing a story. I mean, the Mark Kerr thing is about battling back from drug addictions, but Mark Coleman, you know, you still have the alcohol thing, and um, you know, again, the whole you know. Um, you know, but but whatever it was, I mean, HBO never did the documentary on Mark Coleman for The Rock to see, so yeah. that that was kind of where the impetus of the idea came from. But yeah, I think he could have played, he could have gotten all jacked up and played young Mark Coleman too. <laughs> yeah, because you know, M- Mark Coleman and the story of he was supposed to be the Brock Lesnar opponent, which I completely forgot. Yeah, right, right, right. Oh, Brock would have smashed him too. Although MMA people. Like thought Mark, you know, you know, but Mark, Mark was old then. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, I mean, you're going against a bigger, stronger, not better wrestler, but you know, still in his prime as opposed to being forty year old wrestler. You know, for whatever. See what this was two thousand nine, right? And Mark was born in sixty five. So, but it was just, I think December 65, maybe. So we're talking about 43 year old Mark Coleman against, you know, young Brock Lesnar, you know, he, even with, it wouldn't have been, you know, he wasn't going to beat Brock Lesnar at that stage. I mean, when they were both at their athletic primes, who knows? Um, maybe Mark would have won. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, Mark, Mark did take second in the world championships and, and that's, uh, you know, I mean, that's higher ranked than Brock ever was. You know, also amateur wrestling and, and MMA are different. Um, and Mark was more of a street fighter than Brock. So, um, but Brock also much bigger guy. You know, I mean, Mark was also 220, you know, as a wrestler. And, and Brock was, you know, cut to make 265 walking around at 280. And I didn't realize that Scott Steiner was in that same wrestling and Danny, tournament. And, and Danny Chade. Who, who's the second person? Danny Shade, who was, um, yeah, I mean, um, I think Danny, Danny Shade was in, in the tournament with, with Mark Coleman um, at the same weight also. Who was He went to Gunderson. Oh, was, okay, local. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was, um, I mean, like, I, I knew of him because he was he was from my time. He was actually, um, Danny Shade, you know, who lost to Kurt Angle in the uh, trials, in the finals of the 96 Olympic trials. So he would have been number two in that same tournament this is the 96 tournament that Mark Coleman and Mark Kerr were both in as well. And um, Danny, Danny Shade was like a, I'm going to say three times state high school champion um, at Gunderson. He was um, friends with Scott Coker when both were, um, cause they were the same, they're the same age. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so they were friends at Gunderson and um, 
I knew of him and I knew people who knew him, but I actually did not know him personally, Mm -hmm. you know, which is, which is weird, you know, that I wouldn't, but I, I just never met him and, um, you know, went to Oklahoma state and, um, um, but he was, uh, he was Pewter's wrestling coach. Okay. Okay. Got it. But yeah, I did. I did read that. I did read that. Yeah. Uh, speaking of observer awards that may be locked up already, man, we got some, we, I, I would say that I, I can probably almost visualize several of the awards already box I mean, office, box office promos. It's going to be hard to beat. Don't you think <laughs> I still, I didn't watch the one from today. Yeah. I haven't mean, watched it yet. It was good. It was really good. You know, um, wrestler of the year, you know, I mean, we got, things can be Cody, but we you know that, 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 that one's up in the air, but, um, yeah, best box office draw. Um, so, so did they really most, most charismatic? So they really more than doubled the tickets for SmackDown once they announced that the rock was going to be there more than doubled. Yeah. I mean, people are all mad at me because they were selling out everywhere else without the rock, but, <laughs> but, but Memphis was not going to be that at all. Memphis was 4,500 tickets sold, you know, a couple of weeks out, I think two and a half weeks out. And they announced him. And even, even a week ago, it was, it's not like everybody bought tickets as soon as he, he, um, whatever it was, as soon as they announced him, cause it was up in the sevens, you know, like a week ago, I think in the sevens. And it's like, man, I don't know how they get to 12, you know? And then yesterday, it's like yesterday morning, I got a text from somebody and just goes, they sold out Memphis. And then uh, by weird coincidence, somebody in WWE talked to me like five minutes later <laughs> and was about completely nothing to related that. And I go, you saw Memphis? And it was kind of like, oh, well, you know, you know, like, uh, like they didn't want me to know because I think Dwayne wanted to break it in his promo, mm. but it was sold out the day before. And, um, but yeah, over 12,000. Um, now, do you, do you sense that is because they, that they know that they're going to get whatever the next piece of the angle is with the rock and, and Roman and the bloodline, because it's not just the fact that rock showing up. It's the fact that you're getting actual storyline yeah. stuff for WrestleMania. Yeah, because they, they saw from the last two weeks what they've done on, on these appearances. We're close to WrestleMania. Something's going to happen. And also, you know, Memphis is also, as as markets go, it can be a late buying market um, compared to other markets. Um, so, but yeah, whatever whatever it was, um, you know, I mean, it's not just Rock. I mean, obviously, the, the company is super hot because... Um, I mean, when Rock was in with Cena, it's not like they sold out every TV when he was on. He was in he was in San Jose and they didn't sell out. You know, um, during one of the TVs during one of the two years with Cena, I just remember that one. Where I, was, like, I think I was at that show. Yeah, I mean, I just remember um, being so surprised, figuring that you know, you know, because Rock and Cena was such a giant match at the, both both years was such a giant match, and I just thought Rock being in the building in San Jose, they'd, they'd sell it out. And I mean, they had a good crowd. I think it was like ten thousand. I don't remember the exact number, but I do remember it didn't sell out, and I'm being surprised. So uh, SummerSlam is going to Cleveland, and they let Logan Paul make that announcement. I didn't mm-hmm. hear the podcast. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a different. That was another decision, executive decision, trying to do something different instead of you know releasing it to the regular media. Have Logan Paul make the announcement, and then they sent out their press release right after. The AP didn't release this one. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder who's going to release that Leah Maivia story. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I just I, I I find it I find it interesting that uh, you know lo- I mean Logan Paul's social media is just gigantic anyway, so that's probably the best way to get the word out anyway. I mean it's it's a way, and it's again you know the fact that Logan Paul grew up in Cleveland, um, you know that makes it you know um, it just makes a lot of sense in a lot of ways. Um, he you know he's a very valuable ally to have. I, I'll tell you, like. I mean, not not like Dwayne. Dwayne's different level, but but Logan Paul is very very valuable to them. I think you know. I don't think we talked about this last week, but what did you think about the prime hydration drink being the center logo for WWE PLEs? Well, somebody was going to do it, so you know, it's like. But I mean, I knew it was happening because remember when Ric Flair was on our show, 
you know, they wanted they wanted that deal, and they mm-hmm. were basically told we already have a deal with somebody. Yeah, and, yep. and instead it was Logan Paul. You know, they just hadn't announced the deal yet. I mean, the deal was already made months ago. Knowing what the UFC has done, it, can you sense other things that WWE will possibly do? Like everything, this center everything ring that, thing? Everything that UFC does, WWE will do. There will be the official this. I mean, they're, they're, um, the Cody deal, you know, um, they're going to have like the, the official spirits of the WWE mm-hmm. and, you know, official energy drink of the WWE, which probably be Logan's thing. All that stuff that you see on UFC, they're going to do the exact same thing because that's one of the things that they feel WWE was behind UFC at is the sponsorships, both um you know placement commercials and things like that and signages on you know in the ring on the turnbuckles and all that we're gonna have all of that you know because uh it's not vince's company at all and vince vince could have made money doing that and he never did you know he just didn't like the idea because whatever whatever reason you know i mean you know they didn't have it when he was a kid or he just whatever these people have a completely different concept it's about making you know they're about making money. Not that Vince wasn't, but they're about making money. And, um, but yes, we'll be seeing, uh, you know, what everything that you see that UFC did um, under these people, you're going to be seeing this in WWE as well. And some news that came out today was that Shayna Baszler is going to be on the Bloodsport show WrestleMania weekend, and there's apparently going to be more. Um, so I I did ask about that today too and um just basically like it's not vince anymore you know it's new regime and if you know paul levec talent goes to him we really want to do it they'll open up their eye their their eyes to it you know i mean i mean i I was surprised at blood sport because i would have thought okay if you do it maybe you do it with with new japan pro wrestling or you do it like you know, like um, can't do New Japan if they're working with AEW. Yeah, but I mean something like that. Or you do, you know. Again, I know AEW's got a lot of um, a, you know, AEW's got CMLL, AEW's got New Japan, um, Stardom probably, probably Stardom now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's you know, and I guess if if AEW has Stardom, I guess that that pretty much um, is going to guarantee that idea of Rossi and WWE. If WWE, if if Rossi has talent. Because um, if they want an alliance with the Japanese women's group, which, in fact, last year they absolutely did. And I don't know that anything would change there. So unless they could get in the stardom thing, which, you know, I mean, it's certainly not. The thing is, is because Bushy, Bushy Road owns both. I don't even want to split it. It's not like stardom is going to be affiliated with WWE and New Japan is going to be affiliated with AEW. I think it's going to be both. You mm-hmm. know, it's like WWE, you know, and they've made... You know, Nick Khan made the play how many years ago for for the for the New Japan thing, and you know, again Tony Tony made the better whatever it was, they went with Tony. You know, I mean, I don't know the details of it. I only know the the end result, and um, you know, so you know, I mean, again, like nothing against what anyone, but you know, for for there's a lot of people who really you know knock Tony. Um, and and you know Tony certainly make, makes his mistakes, but but um, again, when it comes to like the you know he, there are three major free agents, the New Japan deal. I mean, he's made some, you know, from a wrestling standpoint, he's made some good deals. He's never made the deal like WWE's made with Peacock or Netflix. He hasn't made those level deals, the television deals. But I mean, could be coming. Could be, yeah. I mean, something could be coming with this new thing. I mean. A lot of people are here. Here's the thing. A lot of people are really impatient. I think that in some ways there's people who by no deal being announced are, are, are afraid. And, you know, again, and I, again, who knows how this is going to turn out? I'm not saying like they're going to get this great deal. Tony seems to be talking more confidently about it. So I think, you know, there may be something there, but, but, um, you know, they are under an exclusive. So if Tony wants to test the waters, on this deal thing, he's he's not going to make a deal today or this week or next week if he wants to test the waters. If he doesn't want to test the waters, and, and again, I think he's got. I mean, clearly he has loyalty to to WBD because we know now, you know, factually that CW came to him for Ring of Honor 
and he wouldn't talk to them, even though yeah. legally he was able to make that deal out of loyalty to WBD. He just thought it would be um, whatever. He didn't think that it would be in good consciousness, good state when WBD has been so good to him, giving him more shows, you know, giving him more money, blah, 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 to then go and shop something to a rival. That's his, that's the mentality and decision that he made. Um, we'll see, you know, um, I mean, he said, he's, he's said on many occasions that he wants to stay with WBD, Mm -hmm. you know, um, loyalty. And again, I mean, of all the things, you know, I mean, obviously Fox wasn't going to take him, which, you know, would have been a game changer, but I mean, again, like the only place I think that would be better for them would be ESPN. And we all know the problems with ESPN, you know, you're going to end up on ESPN two and things like that a lot, which is not a great station. Um, but, but ESPN, I think would have been, but you know, but the, the odds of getting on ESPN weren't that good. Although, you know, the, their pay-per-view business is strong enough and ESPN's look plus was certainly looking at a pro wrestling, um, you know, component. I mean, they've talked to other companies, so it's not like they're against pro wrestling, but you know, you, you know, with, with AW, you want the strong television, you know, component to go with your streaming component and your pay-per-view component. The ESPN direct to consumer thing will probably change the game a little bit. Like I can't imagine direct to the uh, ESPN, the flagship, I think is what they're calling it. I can't imagine you have that and ESPN plus at the same time. It seems like, yeah, isn't that weird? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I can't imagine. I, I mean, that. I mean, long run, I think that they'll, they'll merge it, don't you think? Yeah, I, I do. I, I think so. Um, you know, the thing about Tony getting the free agents and, you know, you hear, oh, he overpaid, he overpaid. Like, he, 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 he okay, here's, here's the deal on that. He overpaid if he doesn't get a better TV deal. If he gets a better TV deal, he didn't overpay. That's the, that's the reality. Okay, but at the but, same time, he is not, a public company he is mm-hmm. a private company mm-hmm. he can invest as much money as he wants he's very well off and i don't think he is feeling the risk of you know we've talked about whether we, or not they'll, we, they'll be profitable we've seen i have seen no signs at all that they're you know tightening and we'll know believe he me. could chop the roster in half he could chop if he the wanted ro- to he could chop the roster in half tomorrow and he doesn't yes he, he could. could use ROH as just a back catalog if he wanted to. Like yeah. there are things that would tell you whether or not they're tightening the purse strings. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know the other thing is, is <clears throat> when we talk about overpaid, I mean now we're getting into that that you know I mean look you and I have both grown up on the sports thing. Oh yeah, where oh my god this team overpaid over and and yet these teams are more and more profitable or in some cases they're not even profitable but they're their value, which is the other thing with, with AEW that people, you know, I think most people figured it out. Some people haven't, but um, the, the value of like, let's, let's just say, let's just say that over the course of 10 years, that AEW in its first 10 years loses a hundred million dollars, just a lot of money. It really is. Okay. Let's say, let's say they, they're a hundred million dollars in losses. And at the end of that 10 years, you know, they're worth $2 billion, um, which is a high number, but, but it, it's, it's not, you know, look, Forbes valued them at that already. I think that's, that's a high number, um, too high for sure, but whatever. I'm, I'm not sure when billion is. I mean, Dana just said some power, if power slap is worth 650 <laughs> million, by the way, which Dana said yesterday and said that they had an offer to buy in at that valuation that they turned down because they're looking at a 1 billion. Um, if power slap is worth 650 million. Okay. AEW is certainly worth 2 billion, yeah. but you know, if, if WWE is worth six and a half billion, AEW is not worth 2 billion. So, you know, whatever. Triple H, ship, Triple H should not get any ideas of trying to bring the WBF back. Mm, he would, he wouldn't have the power to do it. I, I'm listening to a, a podcast covering 1992 right now, and they, and they utilize your your uh, observer for a lot of it. So r- right now I'm in the WBF stage of that show. So that's, I remember it's, it's, I, I remember the WBF. I mean, it's funny when that started because I don't know it was it was 
I, I want is bodybuilding bigger than or not? Because I don't really follow it or anything. I mean, I did when I was a kid, but I don't really at all now. It doesn't it doesn't feel like it's ever been bigger than it was in the seventies, right? Well, you know, it's weird. It's weird because that's what I would say. Um, but I don't know if it's true. It's just like a different stage of your life. Like, yeah, in the seventies, it it felt more like. It felt bigger to me. It's probably because of Schwarzenegger and Ferrigno, though, because they actually channeled the bodybuilding into becoming actors. Yeah. But but even like the Frank Zane, Franco Colombo guys, Sergio Oliva, it's like, but maybe I was just a kid then. So that that it's like I knew all those guys. And like now, you know, I mean, I see those, you know, the guys that are like twice their size and look freak freakish. And it's like I'd never want to look like them. They look like they're about to blow up and have heart attacks. You know what I mean? It just changed. I guess I, I would have heard of Lee Haney for a while. Yeah, that, well, I mean, I, you know, Lee Haney and Dorian Yates, of course. You know, Ronnie Coleman. I mean, I, I yeah, Ronnie Coleman. Coleman as well. You know, I met. Did I ever tell you I met Ronnie Coleman? I was in a, a flight with Ronnie Coleman once. Did he fit? Did he uh, fit in the seat? He was super nice, by the way. Like we were, we were on a flight to. Um, I think that he was competing in San Jose. Now that I think about it, um, and I was coming in from. He, I think he lived in Texas. So I think that I was flying from um, Atlanta because I was going to some wrestling shows through Dallas to San Jose. And he was getting ready for a contest eating, you know, tuna out of the can and everything. <laughs> and um, but I think he was from Dallas, Texas, and he got off on Dallas. And we were just by luck of the draw, you know, we ended up sitting together and talking the whole flight. I mean, not really nice guy. And, and he was big. But then I saw him like two years later and it was, it was interesting because um, do you know who Paul Love is by any chance? I don't think so. Okay. Paul Love was a bodybuilder power lifter um, in San Jose, who was pretty well known in San Jose back in the seventies and eighties because, you know, I mean, he was one of those guys that was like everyone in town knew him because he had these giant arms and it's just, you knew Paul Love, right? And and you know, um, a super nice guy, by the way. Um, and his father, his son-in-law is um, what's the guy's name? Who I also met um, because he, he went to um, he went to MMA shows with our family, and um, they mar- he married Paul's daughter. Um, super famous. Like I'm, I'm going to kill myself for not knowing. <laughs> I was at a wedding. I, I was at it was it was um, I was at a wedding with him. The, the guy had the the. Who was the guy? God damn. He had like the best, like he always lost to Dorian Yates. Um, but he had the best physique I ever saw. Ever. Like, like for a, a normal person, like Dorian Yates was just like thick, freaking gigantic. But this guy, um, God, we're on a bodybuilding tangent. <laughs> I'm really mad I don't know his name. He had he had he ended up having kidney problems. Um but I met him at um, we were we I met him many times, but but we were at a wedding together um, with um, I don't want to go through that, but I was we were into wedding together. But um, so so Paul Love, how did I get from Paul? Paul Love brought Ronnie Coleman in, okay, to guest pose a couple of times at shows, and we went once, and it was just like it was like right before the Olympia, and. I saw I, he was like gigantic, like just freaking unbelievable gigantic. I'd seen all those guys from a different era. And and I think he only placed eighth in that Olympia. OK, it was before he went on that string where he won every year. Then I saw him a couple of years later at, you know, again, I don't even remember. We were somewhere and there's Ronnie Coleman. And at this point, Ronnie Coleman's like 330 pounds, I'm going to say, um, you know, all bulked up. To where he didn't even look human, um, you know, like five nine, three hundred and thirty pounds with arms and legs that are just like you would not. They're, they're not even, you know, they're not even human. And, you know, it was before he would cut down for a contest, and I would, and I saw him, and and I just remember like he looked like it hurt him so much to walk. Mm. And I know he's in, he's had like lots of physical problems, you know, since then. So anyway, that's my Ronnie Coleman stories, but. Um, I, uh, Paul Love. It looks like he passed away in about 2019. I didn't even hear about that. That's too bad. I, I, I he was a, he promoted shows here. So Paul Love's son-in-law. I'm going to kill myself not knowing the name. Yeah, I, I, I cannot find that information. I, I've tried. 
Okay. But uh, he he always compete. It's so funny. I don't I don't know Sean Ray, but this is the guy who who would always beat Sean Ray in the contests. Sean Ray it was like he was the big um like ah oh god. He he married Madeline Love and there were weddings that we went to where because of someone who I know and Madeline Love, someone who you know too, um were were good friends from their younger girly days, you know, like running around and everything. And so we went to some of those weddings and he was, they, then they would sit us together because, you know, I was sort of, sort of bodybuilder type thing. And they thought we would get along. So mm -hmm. that's how I met him. And then he went to some of the strike force shows with us, um, you know, in the Frank Shamrock days and Kung Lee days. Wow. Yeah. Everyone, there's going to be all kinds of people going like, how did you forget this guy's name? <laughs> and, and there's going to be another section of people going why are we talking about bodybuilding okay you know what you should do go go and look up dorian yates and find out who he beat because this guy took second to dorian yates and he was living in san jose and i used to go to like like east not east Ridge, oak ridge right i'd go to oak ridge and they'd have these life-size posters of this guy and you would just look at it and go like oh my god this guy it's like like he would have won multiple mr olympias if freaking dorian yates wasn't around at the exact same time Okay, um, I'll 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 look it up, but let let's, and, let's and, move on, and I'll tell you okay, when okay. I find it. All right. Uh, on Twitter, Tony Khan posted that uh, Brian Danielson and Shibata are going to have a match on <laughs> to Collision <laughs> tomorrow night. Yes. Well, I mean, cool. I mean, look, it's great. It's it's great that that both of those guys have wanted this match. I mean, when when Shibata. When Shibata and Tony talked and Tony said, you know, you know, basically offered him the chance to wrestle. He wanted he, he asked for Orange Cassidy and he asked for Brian Danielson. And, you know, they just they got gave him Orange Cassidy right away and they just had got to Brian Danielson. And Brian Danielson, of course, of course, if you know Brian Danielson, you know, this is like a dream match for him. So um I mean it's look, it's it's you know, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, the deal, you know, I mean, it's like, it's, it's going to be a great wrestling match uh, with unique transitions and holds and things like that. And some kicks and things like that too. And, you know, Brian Danison is going to beat him and to build up for Will Ospreay. And it does make perfect booking sense to beat a Japanese superstar on your way up the, the line to get to, uh, Will Ospreay in this dream match at the end of April. So there you go. It's not Flex Wheeler, is it? It absolutely is Kenneth Flex Wheeler. Okay. Do you know do you know him? I do not. I mean I know the name, but I don't I don't know that of course I would it's recognize Flex Wheeler. Him. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get I'm gonna get killed by people who know him for like not remembering his name, but I mean I you know, whatever. He had a lot of health issues later in life. Um you know, um, but uh, whatever. I mean, um, yeah. Uh, okay, so the Kevin Kelly story, you wrote about it in The Observer. Um, obviously, this is related to the tweets that he made earlier this month. And, you know, there's the Enrique Abani Discord messages that kind of uh, got made public. Um you know, when I read that, I just sensed that Kevin was frustrated with his role, maybe not being the number one play by play. And uh, I think it based on those messages, he thought maybe the reason was because of the things that Ian had said about him. What is your gauge on the Kevin Kelly st uh, stuff? I just know it's a legal issue. So so um, everything is up in the air and. While I there's stuff, um, there's stuff that I was pretty much told, you know. I mean, I don't know. It was, I I have a gauge of it to a degree, but as far as like how it's all going to turn out, I have no idea. Um, but Kevin Kelly is, he, he was he, taken off of the he's, page. He, he's he's definitely off as an announcer. I don't know if he will be back. I don't think it looks good that that he will be back. Um, I think that when, you know, it's like when he answered, like, like 
privately, you know, Twitter's not private, you know? Yeah. I mean, um, I mean like with, with Ian, he thought it was private and somebody betrayed his confidence. And then other people go, Oh, once you do it, I'm one of these things, everything's fair game. Yeah. It's just going to get screenshot. And, yeah, and, and, and it is, I mean, look, there's a lot of people who used to post on our boards, you know, that were reporters that were insiders in MMA and in pro wrestling who got run off because they thought if I post on the observer board, it's just Dave and us and, you know, a couple people on the observer board, not realizing that it's not, you know yeah. what I mean? And, and so they're just gone. A lot of people like that, actually. And, you know, but, you know, until that happens, you know, you kind of go, oh, it's just us and our friends. Twitter's not that, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I, you know, I can see where Kevin was frustrated, you know, um, perhaps. I mean, he certainly sounded that way, but I don't know. I don't know that going on Twitter uh, served him well. I mean, well, it, it, I mean, he specifically said, he specifically said, Ian his, well, that, but also that his boss hadn't talked to him about it. Yeah. So it, it was almost like a plea, like, hey, maybe if I make this public, then maybe Tony will have this conversation with me. And yeah. then Tony was asked about it in a call and he said, or not, no, it was on an interview. It was an interview with TV Insider. Yeah. And he said he, he was not going to make a comment about it. Right, right, right. Yeah. He never, he, you know, even if it wasn't, um, a legal situation. I don't know. You know, you never know what what, what he'll say. But generally, when it comes to personnel matters, um, he's pretty tight tight lipped in most cases. You know, more than you know, whatever. That's that's. But but once it's a legal matter, and this is, and then you know, there's not a chance that he's going to talk about it. Last couple things here. I saw Masvidal and Nate Diaz are going to have a. This is a boxing match. They're going to do a boxing match, which co-promoted by both of them. Co-promoted by both of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, like I think that their mentality is, is that we did whatever number of buys and UFC got all the money. Right. Yeah. But if we do a boxing match away from UFC, we'll get all the buys and we'll get all the money. But the thing they didn't realize is that a lot of the fat, the, the reason that they did all those buys is because it was a UFC pay-per-view because mm-hmm. one of the things, and I mean, you know, I, 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 I don't know if you saw the, 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 the Joshua number, you know, with um Naganu. Oh, the pay-per-view number. I mean, my God. I mean, like literally nobody bought that pay-per-view. I mean, it was, it was way under, it's like half of what, Nagano did with Fury in the United States. And that was a horrible number. I mean, this was less than TNA, much less than TNA. I mean, Friday afternoon. Friday afternoon doesn't help. No, not at all. I mean, this was, I think there was like a one quarter of TNA, roughly, is what they did. I mean, just a ridiculously low number for, you know, you know, a big, you know, Joshua was one of the biggest name heavyweights. Nagano, you know, UFC star and former champion never lost his title and Naganu, you know, some people thought he actually beat Fury or, but certainly was competitive with him. So there is that question of that Superman thing, even though like, you know, this one turned, you know, I mean, it was like reality struck, which, you know, would have with the Fury had Fury taken seriously, but, um, but people didn't buy it at all. And so one of the things is, is like, you know, these kind of fights, even though people talk about them, and, and I mean, there was a lot of, you know, social media buzz and Google searches and all this that would have indicated people would buy it. But what has happened is either people find a free stream um, or they just want to read about it, but they're not going to pay for it. In, uh, in this particular fight, you only needed to watch Twitter. Yeah. Just to see the two knockdowns, and that was it. Yeah, yeah. And so DAZN put that stuff out there, it seemed, unless it wasn't DAZN. I feel like I saw it, you know, very soon after it happened, and I was like, oh, I'm, I didn't have to pay for this. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, but I, again, like with Diaz and Masvidal, I mean, there will be, you know, I mean, I don't know how it'll do, but I don't think it's going to do anything close to what it did before, you know, um, and partially because it's boxing. And also, you know, when they had that fight, I mean, even though, like, you know, I mean, God bless Nate Diaz. You know what I mean? It's like he can lose a fight 
you know, and, and somehow comes out smelling like a rose, you know, you know, whatever it is, it's like, he's, he's like one of those wrestlers who's bulletproof. Um, and I mean, he got, he got, I felt when he fought Masvidal, he got destroyed. I felt it was like he was slaughtered in that fight. So do I want to see them box? You know, maybe, I mean, neither of them are boxers and, and they both trained as boxers and it is a different sport. And maybe, you know, maybe Nate's boxing skill will make it different. I don't know. But when I saw that MMA fight. Well, Nate uh, fought Jake Paul, right? Yeah. Yeah. Didn't win that one. Not to, not that Masvidal would. By the way, did you see Jake and Logan Paul are at our edge of the strokes? The brothers? Yeah. I guess what happened was um, Logan on his podcast, when talking about the Tyson fight, said that they came to me for the Tyson fight and 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 said, I think I'd beat him because he's too old. But like, for whatever reason, he said he turned him down. And Jake is just like, he's just lying. And he, <laughs> goes, he went through this whole explanation of how the fight happened. And it's like, you know, it's not like somebody went to us. It's like we were, you know, Jake um, was talking to um, Netflix Mm -hmm. about a fight. And then they came up and they made an offer big enough money wise, you know, between Netflix and Jake to get Tyson on board. You know, it wasn't like, oh, yeah, Tyson wants a fight. He'll fight. You know, hey, Logan, Tyson wants a fight. You want to fight him? It's like he was saying, like, nothing like that happened. And he, he's just like, why would my brother lie? You know, I was like, I was surprised. You know, hey, your just, brother is in pro wrestling right now. That is why he would lie. <laughs> There's your answer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the way, do you uh, what, what do you think the chances is that that fight actually does happen? Because Tyson, I guess Tyson is getting his money, but he has been known to you know, oh, yeah. finagle, finagle his way out of stuff. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's sad. That's all I'll say. It's, it's sad. I, and I don't, again, like, you know, I believe that the freak show stuff, um, is pretty much like run its course, but this might be one that, that, you know, just because of the names, Jake Paul and Mike Tyson, that may be weird enough that it, it actually does something and it's on Netflix. So it's not, you know, it's not like this $50, $100 pay-per-view. It's just a Netflix subscription. I think like lots of people are going to watch it out of curiosity, but generally speaking, by the way, like when we're talking about Nagano and, um, and uh, Joshua. Joshua fight, it's like they did like whatever it is, 5,000 buys on, on television pay-per-view and, you know, whatever it is that they did on zone. But think about this. Joshua supposedly got 50 million and Nagano got 20 million because of Saudi Arabia. Isn't that the most insane thing you've ever heard in your life? Like that kind of money when, when, and, and Tony Khan is overpaying for free agents. <laughs> now this, this is, <laughs> now, now those guys were overpaid. <laughs> those two were overpaid, but, but yeah, yeah. Um. All right. Let's, uh, let's end it with something that maybe we probably care more about than anybody else because of where the location is, but fight night at the tech explain what fight night at the tech is. Oh, Scott Coker and Gilbert Melendez are starting their own promotion and they want to regularly run at the tech, uh, center. I think is what it's called in San Jose, 4,200 seat building that the San Jose Barracudas of the Barracuda of the AHL play in. And Scott, you know, Scott is, um, Scott made a lot of money through the sale of Strike Force to UFC because he was 50% owner. And so, so he made it, you know, I mean, he made enough to where, you know, he could travel the world. And I think he did for a while. And then it's just kind of like he wasn't so old that, that he didn't want to go back to work. So he went back to work and ended up with Bellator for a couple of years. The PFL offered him a job there and he didn't want to do it. You know, it was like he wants to be his own boss. He's, you know, it's it's funny. It's like it's like he actually kind of reminds me of um, Rossi Ogawa, same type of age, the age thing. Kind of like I don't want to work for people anymore. I just want to mm-hmm. run my own thing and have fun. And um, so, so him and Gilbert are going to start a show. Um, they're going to use local fighters, you know. So it'll be, you know, and 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 it's kind of like reminiscing about your childhood because Scott 
started this in 1985. I used to go to his shows with Kung Lee and all that before Kung Lee was famous outside of San Jose. He was he was famous in San Jose. But um, Strike Force going to the kickboxing and the Muay Thai and all the stuff that they had before the before long before there was MMA. I mean, Scott was, um, you know, I mean, he, he pretty much right out of college, you know, doing the martial arts promoting. So this is like what he likes. So he's, you know, going to get young fighters. And and I don't know how, you know, again, I don't know if there's a market for this. Sometimes when, when, when I saw this, I thought, you know, Scott, it's just kind of like, you know, like, like when, when, when guys, like when it's a bad analogy, well, maybe it's a great analogy. I don't know. Um, okay. This is my analogy. Um, Jim Crockett, Jim Crockett promotion sells to TBS, right? Thinks he's going to be running it. Then they give him the boot. Okay. So his non-competes up and he starts a promotion in Texas. You know, he wants mm-hmm. to do regional wrestling like he did his whole life. But regional wrestling in 1993, it's just like doesn't work anymore. Mm-hmm. And and you know he had a short run and it was gone. And it's like in the 1980s and 1990s, you know, and and all that, you know, Scott would do these shows and they would draw pretty good. And you know, got it. He got his ESPN deal, so you know he got TV rights and everything. And it was you know it was it, it worked out. It it was successful. Um, and then, you know, strike force nationally got the deal with showtime and bell tour and everything. And, you know, they were, you know, strike force was successful until it was sold. And then bell tour, whatever, you know, was not as successful in, in some ways, but, um, you know, still whatever. Um, but it's like, I, when, when I heard this, one of the things was, is kind of like, you know, the territories are over, you know what I mean? Like the yeah. idea of running like these small fight shows. Um, and expect, you know, like, cause Scott would draw, you know, um, four to 5,000 people at these shows. So 4,200 seats, he's probably looking to, yeah, it's, it's, you know, no big names, 4,200 nice, nice little promotion. Right. But I don't know that like in today's day and age, cause you remember fighting, it was so scarce. It's not like it's on UFC's on TV every freaking week. And the number two promotion, which is now PFL is on TV and people don't even watch it and don't even buy the pay-per-views. And one never got a foothold in this country. Um, and now you're going to try to do just like, you know, up and coming fighter shows, you know, again, there was a period when up and coming fighter shows in, in California, you know, um, you know, like in 2006, 2007, you know, did very, very well, but it's like, it's not, it's 2024 and you don't even hear about those shows anymore. So well, Good luck. Uh, for for one, UFC doesn't come out here anymore, so we don't have any. Yeah, they haven't been in San Jose in years. We don't have any fighting whatsoever. And and now with your yeah, Bellator came, but with Scott out of Bellator, I don't expect PFL to come here. No, uh, so you know that there the, if, if there's interest and Scott is known out here, you know the other thing is I remember uh, I had a buddy from Gilroy who was fighting. I think his son is actually uh, you know a decent prospect, but. He, you know, he was he fought on a couple of the uh, strike force shows. And I remember like he was given a book of like 100 tickets and he had to sell like all 100 of those tickets to actually get to get the fight to get, to get on the card. That's 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 actually not that's 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 what a lot of the small, um, you know, that those type of promotions are all about is like fighters getting their friends to buy tickets. And that's how you get on the card. Yeah. 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 So I was like, all right. Yeah, I'll because we coached uh, flag football, our, our kids together. And so I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll get. So you know, some of the strike force shows that I was going to, I was actually buying his fighter tickets to to get in the building. So, mm. um, yeah, I mean, it's not. It's the, I can't imagine Scott has these, you know, dreams of of you know going national with this. But I mean, no, he, no, no. If no, he if he digs it, then in it, it's fun to give him something to do. It's just it's, it's just in his blood. It's in his blood. I think he wants to do it. I think the idea of developing you know local stars you know, like another Kung Lee, and then they go to, whether it's UFC or PFL or something, you know, being like a, a feeder group. Um, I think, you know, at, at, at his stage, Scott's, I think Scott's 61, if, I, if I'm if i right, because um, I think he's the same age as Danny Chade. And um, so I think um, it's probably just what he wants to do. He doesn't have to do it. He can do whatever he wants with his life, but, but 
I, you know, I mean, he does, he does love the sport. I mean, you know, and fighting and it's again from childhood, you know, doing martial arts. It's, it's He probably feels like he was also in the, in the grassroots aspect of, of getting the thing going too. Well, he was, he was, I mean, as far as importance in the business, um, you know, I mean, Scott was very instrumental in getting this thing going in California and, you know, had great, great success, you know, in that early strike force period. I mean, those, those were some awesome, you know, you went to some of them. Mm-hmm. Those were freaking awesome shows. You know, I mean, the atmosphere wise, because there were some, like, there were some duds too, but yeah, there more, were more there, often there, than, than not, they were good. Yeah. 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 The one with, um, Vitor Belfort and Alistair Overeem. Did you do that one? <laughs> I that did was, not. Okay, that show wasn't good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, a couple but, times that we we interviewed Scott and when we would go to the uh, the Bellator st- stuff, Scott and my uncle were in Taekwondo together when they were younger. So oh, really? every you know, I would off to the side, I would just mention my uncle's name. And he's he'd be like, "Okay, let's call him right now." So I would call my <laughs> uncle, and then Scott would leave him a voicemail. And Scott would leave his phone number, and then I'd talk to my uncle. I go, "Did you, did you call him back?" He's like, "No, I couldn't. It's such a long time ago." I was like, "This is Scott Coker. Like he's." <laughs> You know this is so it was just yeah, yeah for whatever reason he wouldn't call it back but yeah uh all right uh that is it for this show and you and Brian are going to be back on Sunday Sunday night yes Sunday night and uh yeah no really big shows this weekend so well, I mean SmackDown's got Dwayne and Collision's got um Brian Danielson and Shibata and, and then uh, uh, Julie Julia Hart and uh was it Trish Dora, Brian Keith and Kyle o- Brian Keith and Kyle O'Reilly is an interesting match. You know it is, but I mean, Kyle Kyle O'Reilly's entire storyline was I don't know if I have it. This roster is so great, but I've been scouting this one guy. I'm like, you scouted the one guy who always loses. Well, it's actually kind of smart. <laughs> yeah, I know well, we'll probably beat him, but the- Commander's next. It's it's Keith <laughs> and it's Commander. I heard Takeshi and Commander on tonight's show's great on the Rampage show. Oh, I'm sure. I, reading your quotes of Takeshita after that match, like I think he's he 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 sensed that uh, that there's something there that 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 the fan base sees in him. And he's, I, he's awesome. He's awesome. I mean, he's he's got a look. He's got the size. Um, I mean, he's totally miscast. He should be a baby face. But but I I actually do think he should have a heel run for a, for a good year before he turns, rather than turn now. Um, but you know, I, I, I don't know. I there's so much talent there, and you know, it's it's sometimes it's frustrating because you just go like, God, you know, get this guy. But they don't have the the time, and it's you know, it's you can't push forty guys. That's the problem. Do you ever see, do you ever see them brand splitting? I, I I don't know that it's a good idea, but it would actually probably be a little bit more helpful in, in the booking. I mean, there's there's a there's a plus to it, but the negative to it is is that you know, like they don't have enough stars to do that. You know, and um, they, you know, I mean, it's it's funny. They have they have more great wrestlers than than you could ever have, um, but they don't have like the difference. Like WCW had all kinds of it, when when they were had all the Mexicans and everything that that went along with all the other guys. They had like all those great young guys. They and they had all these great wrestlers, although the, but when they had superstars in the main event that that didn't do much in the ring. But they were like superstars, you know, like Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage and Roddy Piper and Ric Flair and, you know, Holland Nash. And he says they were like big, big stars. Um, so AEW doesn't have that, but they have probably like the town on top is like a million times better. Um, but they're for whatever reason, they're not, you know, because it's not, you know, they didn't get the 80s TV and they didn't get the 90s, um, you know, the 90s boom um, thing. They just got the. You know, they, these guys all came up in that period when wrestling was down. So they're stars and people know them, but they're not giant superstars. And, um, you know, there's only so many of them. And then the other guys just, but, you know, I mean, you can't focus. You can't build 40 guys at once, mm-hmm. which is which is actually, you know, one of Tony's problems is, is, is that he's trying to build so many guys and people go, well, we have a powerhouse Hobbs. And it's like, well, he's got 40 guys like this. <laughs> yeah. you know I mean, it's like, yeah, the guy, you know, if he was every time on... you sign an Okada or an Osprey, uh, someone like a powerhouse Hobbs goes down in the pecking order. It goes down two in the pecking or three, you know, two in the pecking order. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, um, but yeah, brand split in that sense makes sense. 
But in the other sense, it doesn't because the problem is, is that you need when you were brands, but you need enough superstars that are so strong in those brands that they can carry the whole brand. And they don't have those guys. If they, if they do build more stars, I think it does help. And, and trust the process was, was saying what I was thinking in the chat is your television shows become very predictable as far as who's going to be on it. Because if you buy a ticket to raw today, you're you, about a hundred percent guaranteed to you know see Cody Rhodes. There. Right. You know, who's going to be there And here. Yes. If you go to dynamite, you don't know if you're going to see John Moxley. You don't know if you're going to see Jericho. You don't know if you're going to see Osprey. You know what I mean? It's like, you might, but you don't know. Yeah. And, and you're right. You know, you know, you're going to see Seth Rollins, you know, you see Cody Rhodes, you know, you're going to see Drew, Drew McIntyre. And, you know, that's, that's a very valid point. Yeah. All right. So you and Brian will be back Sunday night with another show. Uh, and that is it from here for Dave. I'm Garrett to everybody. Thanks for watching and listening.